NGLCC up in Washington. I have been a affiliated with NGLCC since 2006, became a certified LGBTVE in 2007, and don't really have an active chamber in my area. One did surface a few years ago after several attempts have been made, but the reality is that they're, they're, they're suffering right now and they may implode. Uh, their numbers have gone down after two plus years. I myself have chosen not to renew uh, for various reasons. Um, they seem to be more of a social gathering than a real business chamber, and that kind of turned me off. So um, I tried to help them, but to no avail. So I've taken that opportunity to connect myself, you know, in my business with NGLCC at a national level and uh, took uh, advantage of the mentorship program um, in 2014 with Deborah Quade from Kellogg's. And so shortly after, and she and I keep in touch regularly still, even though we're not formally in the mentorship program, she reached out to me knowing that I had done this program for Team NG NGLCC and said, I've got a, a business group here in Western Michigan where Kellogg's is based. And could you do a one hour webinar on time management working from home? This was in April. So that's where I took my program and consolidated it into this one hour. And then I started offering it to various HR groups and I pretty much thought I was done, but I'll tell you the truth. I'm finding as I go through this, April, May, June, July, August, September, and now we're in early October, it's morphing. I'm changing my slides, I'm updating information, and the issues and comments that people are bringing up seems to be changing as we go further into this. And of course, we don't know exactly when it's gonna end. So mental health issues like the ones on the screen are definitely impacting people. Performance, uh, engagement with employees, uh, with their supervisors, with their business owners is an issue, and overall mental health. And a lot of people don't talk about these things, but they are a reality. Just to give us a little background at the very beginning, back in April of 20, CNBC survey, at that point, only 9% uh, were working from home, and that jumped to 42% right away, and 60% than of the employees that were being surveyed at that time were actually feeling that they were as productive, if not more productive, when they first started working at home. Then in May, uh, SHRM, mid-May, SHRM is a Society for Human Resource Management, of which I'm a national and, and local member of two chapters, uh, came out with these statistics. I'm not gonna read them to you, I'm just gonna let you look at them on the screen. Now, mind you, again, this was early on. This was mid-May. I don't have any new data related specifically to this, but I have a few more slides that I want to share. This is an interesting one here, too. We found this, initially, we found this for 2019, and the bar graph looked almost exactly the same. In fact, all of these uh, uh, issues were about the same, off maybe 1% or 2%. The only difference between 2019 and when this was done after uh, the pandemic had begun, um, was that the first and third item switched. Uh, being able to unplug used to be the first one, and it was as high as 22%. And collaboration and communication used to be third down at 17%, and it jumped up to 20. But everything else, loneliness went right in the middle, and everything from distractions on down to Wi-Fi are pretty much in the same place. I thought that was kind of interesting. And here's some study for remote work in early June, over a thousand employees by Corn Ferry. They are a Los Angeles based consulting firm. And here are some uh, uh, items that they found. Now they have 180 offices, uh, 8,600 global employees, but 98% of them do work from home. And this was a study done amongst uh, some professionals that they service. What we do know is large organizations like Facebook has said they'll let people work from home at least through the end of the year. Google has said it's gonna be through the middle of next year. And Twitter said they are likely to allow people to work from home indefinitely. So the workplace is definitely changing. And how is that going to impact you? Another quick study, this was also done around early summer. And again, uh, almost two thirds of people saying that they feel that they're more productive at home than they were when they were working in an office. So that's also very telling. Uh, in case they will be going back. 
So with the remaining slides, we're gonna start looking at 12 facets of time mastery. Let's take a look at these 12 bullets. They are interconnected. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was coaching two different individuals this morning on just this topic. And, you know, different things were coming up for them and the realization that one thing leads to another. You know, your planning could lead to your prioritizing, to your delegation, uh, to your procrastination and so forth. So as we go through the slides, um, the ones that I'm talking about for that particular slide will show up in red. For instance, maintaining regular hours. If you're working from home, you know, it's very important that you try to take a lunch break. You actually stop and say, this was my morning and now this is my afternoon. That psychological break can really increase your productivity. If you're a morning person, you might get some of your big items done in the morning and save the afternoon for smaller things, research, uh, reading reports, um, you know, contacting people, responding to emails, so forth. But you may be the opposite. You may not be a big morning person and save some of those big ticket items for the afternoon. So a lot of this has to do with what's comfortable for you. Taking regular breaks is also part of that. It can impact your attitude and also uh, minimize your interruptions. And this is where a lot of people uh, were forgetting to do at the very beginning because they felt like they had to just work, 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 work. But when you are in an office, you do take breaks, you take bio breaks, you, you get liquid, you get snacks, you get food, um, whatever you tend to do, or you just move off to something else or just take a stretch walk around, talk to, go to the printer, go to the mailroom. I mean, there's less and less of that happening when you're working from home, especially if there are other people around, because many of our homes are not really designed for working from home. So it really becomes a challenge. But find ways to take regular breaks uh, throughout your day. Psychologically, um, it's really important and it can re-energize you. Um, if you have anybody that you know that's in the high school uh, arena uh, as a student or even a, a faculty member, a lot of high schools have switched their scheduling from 45, 50 minute subject uh, meetings, uh, uh, classes, to block time, if you've heard of that. And that's basically saying, we're, instead of having students come to chemistry class four or five times a week, they're probably only going to come twice a week, but they're going to come to it and have a block of an hour and a half to two hours to focus on that one subject. So during the course of the day, they may only have three subjects, but they're focusing on them in greater detail. There's less movement, there's less, you know, going in the hallways, uh, taking of attendance, collecting homework, uh, blah, 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 and more time for actual, you know, teaching and learning. And, you know, not getting through all that, and then all of a sudden the bell rings and it's time to move on to something else. Well, we can use those examples in what we're doing as well. Thinking about where we want to put large blocks in our schedule and making appointments with ourselves to stick to those things. So taking breaks in between though is important to move around um, and to clear the head from one thing to another. Here I'm not talking about you know, computer viruses, I'm talking about the virus updates about what's going on in the big world. I mean, there's a lot happening. There is a you know, very, very um, polarized election that is happening in the next few weeks. Um, the fact that our current president you know, was, came down with the COVID over the weekend, was hospitalized and, and left the hospital so abruptly, uh, the economy, um, the school situation where there's you know, blended learning, totally closed openings, closings, uh, very disruptive for, for those of you who may be parents, and uh, social justice issues. So there's really a lot going on. And my suggestion here is to try to minimize as much as you can about the news. Oftentimes the news is very heavy. Um, it can sidetrack you. It can pull you down. So it really doesn't help you uh, to be getting constant feeds, constant reminders, your, your phone going off all the time telling you the latest breaking news. Um, if you can minimize that, you can also allow yourself to be more productive. Set boundaries and ground rules with people in your space. Um, I am very fortunate. I've worked from home for, like I said, for 
21 years, although I go out and service clients in my area or around the country. Uh, but now my spouse is working from home and he's never worked from home before. And he really doesn't like working from home. But we're fortunate in the sense that we have a very large house. We don't have any children. We don't have any pets. And we have a home office that he's using at the opposite end of the house. And when I'm doing things like a webinar now or a phone call, um, I will close my door and he will do the same. And that's an indication to the other that not to be disturbed. Um, but otherwise, you know, voices can carry if we're in the center of the house very easily. So it's setting those ground rules with the people around you. And this could also be something that's constantly changing. Whatever you had in place, maybe in March, April, or May, may be different now that you're in October. Developing the day's focus with a creative, realistic to-do list. This is really, really valuable. Again, this would be great back in the workplace if you're not working from home, but now that you're working from home, maybe even more so. You know, you don't want to start your day, open your computer, go into a vague plan, um, you know, the email black hole. You want to do things that are going to uh, uh, allow you to accomplish things, um, to de-stress you, and that don't uh, discourage you. So a great technique is thinking about spending time at the end of your workday to look at your to-do list in the last 15 minutes of the day. Stop the text, stop the email, stop the phone calls and say, I'm ending at five or 5.30 or six or whatever you choose to do and say for the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna spend time reviewing my to-do list, seeing what I did, seeing what needs to be moved over into tomorrow and reprioritize and replan. Psychological studies have been done on this because our minds are like an iceberg floating in the water. Picture that iceberg for a moment. The conscious part of our mind, the part where you're engaged right now in this program, listening, watching, is the conscious part. But that's the smallest part of the iceberg. The subconscious mind is what's below, and that's the part of your brain that works 24 seven. So when you don't put things to rest, those things can jump into your head at all times. It's a thing that pops into your head at the least you know, uh, valuable time. You may not have a piece of paper where to write something down or have your phone to record it. Um, it can also be the kind of thing that keeps you up at night. But studies have been done that when people properly review their list at the end of the day, they actually can, can be more at ease, more at peace, and then start the next day by looking at that list one more time. And of course, at the end of the week, you want to do that maybe for half an hour to evaluate the entire week and plan for the week that comes ahead. Now, Stephen Covey um, you know, wrote a monumental book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And this particular matrix is a good reminder at this time. He said, there are times that we have to be in the crisis mode. That's the things that are important and urgent. We must deal with them right then and there. But if we're constantly in this quadrant, we're not serving ourselves well. The third quadrant is where things are important, not important, but are urgent. And sometimes these end up being trivial things that we get caught up in. Again, we don't want to spend too much time there. This is an area of deception. Quadrant four are things that are both not important or urgent. We feel like we're doing them and we're being busy, but are we really accomplishing anything to our end goals? Covey would have said that, and by the way, he's passed away and his son has taken over the business, um, that these would be time wasters. But the place he says we really need to be is in quadrant number two. Those are the things that are both important, but not necessarily urgent. That's where you should be spending most of your time. Brian Tracy, who's written a lot of books on sales, was quoted as saying, for every 10 for every minute that we spend planning, we're gonna get back 10 minutes in valuable time. And one of our founding fathers, Ben Franklin, known for many of his sayings, said this, if we fail to plan, we can plan to fail. One more time. If we fail to plan, we can plan to fail. And a corollary to that is that we learn to plan we can actually plan to learn. 
And that coincides with what Covey was saying is that that's why we need to spend more of our time in quadrant number two, things that are important, but not necessarily urgent. And in actuality, we're not ever really managing time. We're actually managing events. Technology is great, all these different things, but we have to be able to manage them. Designated times, not constantly being interrupted by people, making appointments, managing your schedule. If you share your calendar with other people, be sure that you can block out some times that people cannot fill with things that they want to put in. Because then they're creating their urgency, which is not necessarily your urgency. What I'm hearing from a lot of people is that people are interacting with others, either in the same organization or clients that feel like they need to spend more time with you because they're a little bit more lonely during this time of extreme isolation. But that's their personal need. And you wanna be sure that you're managing that for yourself. Other people are saying, many people are asking you to join meetings that are not really of value to you. And you get out of these meetings and you say, that could have been handled with an email or I really didn't need to be there. So all of this technology that can help us be more effective doesn't always work to our benefit. Here's a little guide on the value of meetings, what things we should think about as we're trying to set one up or consider being part of one. Why? Who? What? and how. There are things that can be handled through email. I know we all don't love email, but sometimes it's the better way to go than asking people to gather together in real time. At the same time, I also find that sometimes emails can be overextended and you've got a thread that goes back and forth too many times. It would have been best off to have a conversation uh, on the phone, or, or um, by having a video conference or something like that. It's important too to socialize with your colleagues, be creative. It's important to connect with people. You would do this in the workplace. You would stop by each other's offices and cubicles or you know, meet them in the break room or have lunch together or just sit down and have a cup of coffee. I have a coaching client. She's actually in New York. They have an office in Manhattan, but they've all been working remotely since March. And what she does with her small team, it's a nonprofit, and there's about six, seven employees all together, and she's the head. Basically, on Tuesdays, they get together for an hour and a half to two hours, and they discuss business. She has things that come from the board of directors or committee members, and she shares that with them, and they, in turn, may have information to share up. But on Thursdays, she actually has a time set aside. Could be an hour, hour and a half maximum for a personal get together, no business discuss whatsoever, where they can really just connect on a personal level. And the team really looks forward to it. It's at the end of the day on Thursday, so it's towards the end of the week, and they can share recipes, they can talk about something, a movie they watched, a book they read, or just updates on their personal lives. And allowing that to be somewhat compartmentalized so that the contact and connections are still there, even though, um, you know, we generally tend to do these throughout the week in under normal circumstances, but don't lose the social aspect. We are social human beings and some people need this more than others. Get dressed. This can impact your attitude. This is a personal choice. You know, does it set your mood for the day? Some people say, if I don't get dressed to start my work day, I don't feel like I'm at work. I still feel like it's the weekend or the evening. So I take the time. Some women say I put on makeup. Some men say they put on makeup. Um, so, <laughs> some uh, men, you know, possibly shave as they normally would. And, um, you know, a decision that, that they're doing, they're going to work. They're feeling like a professional. Again, this is a personal choice and it ca can have an effect on your attitude. Now, another thing to consider is that transition into and out of work. That's something a lot of people have lost because of this. I mean, many of you, I'm assuming, uh, might be, you know, driving to your workplace or traveling into the city if, if you uh, uh, are outside New York City or Philadelphia, depending on where you are, or, you know, some other city 
But that transition time of moving from a personal activity in your morning to starting your work day, and then at the end of the day, wrapping up your work day and going back to your personal life. It's very easy to just shut the laptop and say, here I am. And you might be at the very same dining room or kitchen table that you'd be eating at in a short while or you just ate at a few minutes ago. But when we are transitioning, there is a commute. We might listen to the radio. We might listen to the news, talk radio. We might spend time listening to an audio book if we have a long drive or something motivational. Or we just might want silence. So going for a walk in the morning, I know it's getting cooler up north, but even in brisk weather could be very good. Say to yourself, okay, I'm at home. I'm going to throw on my jacket. I'm going to go for a little walk in the neighborhood, kind of come back, and then I'm quote unquote at work. And then do the same thing at the end of your day and get yourself back into the personal time. This is really, really important, and we've lost this. So something to consider. We said before that you have to ask for things with people you live with. You also maybe need to do this with your colleagues, with your team, with your supervisor if you have one. Be very, very clear. I mean, I had a coaching client here in Florida at the beginning of this, and her husband had a job that required her to work outside the home, so he could not work from home. And so she was left with their seven-year-old daughter, the one child, in the second grade. And she needed to have a real conversation with her supervisor about, look, we planned a lot of things for 2020, but everything has gone upside down. And right now I have to be available to my daughter who's learning virtually, and she's only seven years old. What would you like me to prioritize? How can we make this work so I can still fulfill my work duties and still be there for my parent, for my, as a parent? And of course, many organizations talk about work-life balance, and we certainly want to ensure this as well. So again, be sure to ask for what you need. Just a couple of more slides to go, and then we're gonna open up for the conversation. Hold yourself accountable to things. You know, See the accomplishments, look at your big pictures, understand where you're wasting time, understand that busyness, B-U-S-Y, N-E-S-S, -S -S, doesn't necessarily mean you're bringing in real results. So what is time management? It's managing events and it's self-management. Another thing I want to remind you is to stay positive. You know, what can you do for yourself? How can you stay motivated? Joe and I were talking about this before you all came on. Things are changing, you know, week, month by month, week by week, and sometimes day by day. As I said, there's a lot going on in the outside world that could be impacting your work, your business. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of restrictions. Things are opening. Things are closing. Children are in school, out of school, so on and so forth. <clears throat> but each week, each day, try to do something that helps you stay positive um, so that you can get things done. Now, I realized early on also that we're going through some elements of grief with this. There's a lot of loss going on. I feel it. I'm not seeing family and friends as much as I used to. I'm certainly not traveling, and my spouse and I do love to travel. We had trips planned this year that had to be canceled. And right now, we're not even planning anything going forward because we don't know when we're going to feel comfortable doing that again. So I feel like I'm grieving a lot. And in my prior life before opening my own business, I had worked at our local hospice. And by doing so, I was exposed to the works of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on the stages of grief. And here they are. Some people start with denial and anger, and that could lead to depression. Before we get to an element of bargaining and making peace with something, and then moving back up into feeling like we can accept what we have. When I used to talk about this back at the hospice, I said, you know, this applies to any loss, a job loss, money loss, uh, a loss of a relationship, or even a close friendship. It doesn't have to be somebody that actively dies. So I want you to think about this and note that, you know, we want to move people away from the denial and anger to the depression and finally get them back to some element of resilience. And on my website, I have a blog, and I actually wrote a couple of entries in the spring that you can still access 
on these topics. They may be of value to you. Lastly, accept yourself. This is a big thing right here. Allow yourself to be where you're at in the moment. I have days when I'm really productive and I feel energetic and I have other days when I'm feeling way more lethargic. There are reasons why and I just accept it. I say today I'm not gonna be as productive, but I also have the, the luxury that if I wanna get some work done on a Saturday or a Sunday, which some of you might have, I choose to do that. I choose to do that. I feel like if I start fresh, without interruptions, without appointments. I could get a couple of things knocked out and that's gonna make me feel good. But accept yourself for wherever you are psychologically. And lastly, if you're gonna bring in any new habits to your life, it could take between three days and three weeks for them to kick in if you're trying to change something. Figure out what you wanna get rid of, how you're gonna change it, and then when you do change it, make sure that you have purpose in what you're doing. Stick to it. And finally, as I said before, be sure to ask for help. So with that, I bring us back to the original slide. And it's pretty much the same. The only difference in the bottom right-hand corner, there is a short survey. And I'm going to ask Joe to send this out afterwards in case you guys don't get a chance to pick it. But with that, I'm going to come back on the screen and allow Joe to lead us through whatever we can do, whatever we can talk about with the time that we have remaining. Well, Joshua, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I think it's, it's fantastic. Uh, I liked a lot of the information you gave. It kind of validates some things that I've been thinking about and uh, considering as a person who works from home. Um, I think I'd like to kick it off with questions and please everyone ask questions if you'd like, but I'd like to kick it off with a question, uh, Joshua, regarding the last slide specifically that you showed. Um, all of those suggestions are very purposeful and being someone, exactly, being someone in terms of new habits, being someone who is on and off through my career work from home, and at the same time, have, I've been in sales for over 30 years. And sales is, is for the most part, uh, the greater part, a solitary pursuit. Not many people sell in teams. Uh, you sell on your own and you work your own client base and what have you. So as a salesman, you're kind of always, I was prepared for this type of situation that we're in with COVID-19. I've worked from home for years and really I was not emotionally struck by not being in an office somewhere because I never was for years. Um, but this, the, the, the new habit slide that you have up, I find interesting because do you think that people, um, the biggest challenge is people giving themselves the time to really analyze their own situation, to say, I am dealing with this thing of COVID-19 and take the time to like deal with it as opposed to just let me get my work done and jump from one thing to the next. Because I find that in people that I interact with for my business, that they seem unprepared to, you know, readapt to we're taking this meeting today on a webinar and, you know, we're, we're in October now, get used to this. I kind of want to say this to people, but I don't, but they still seemed ill at ease with taking a virtual meeting as opposed to an in-person meeting, you know, and I want to say, how, how much time do you need longer to deal with this, you know, um, again. And that's, that's to say that some people may still be in the denial stage or right. say, oh, this will be over soon. And, and you know, we can, we're going to get together very shortly. A lot of people were saying that when the schools closed, they were like, oh, we'll close to the end of the month. Oh, it will be through the beginning of May. Oh, it, you know, and before you know it, that was the end of the spring term. You know, everybody was done. Um, even companies like, oh, we're going to open up by the summer and travel will continue. And, you know, nobody knows the answers and everybody's at a different comfort level. Obviously, there's a true political divide on this. There are people following CDC guidelines, others that are not. Um, but, you know, that's also part of the challenge here. We're not all going in the same direction. So it's really challenging, but you basically have to say, look, this is what's comfortable for me. I need to meet with you virtually. I'm not ready to interact. And Joe and I were talking about this before everybody came on too. You know, we've reached a an element of COVID fatigue. You know, like we're all tired of this already. I know I am. I've been saying it for a few weeks. I've, I'm so tired of this. And you know, I'm fortunate enough to live with somebody, you know, that I share my life with and we have each other for companionship. Um, but there are a lot of people living alone during this time. And I can't imagine 
how many of them, you know, face this um, without social interaction or, or some connection. But um, just because we're tired of it, that this is what I read somewhere recently, we may have COVID fatigue, but COVID doesn't have any fatigue. The virus is still there and it's still spreading. So the reality is, how are we going to adapt ourselves? Right. The, uh, I've also noticed, uh, and I don't want to uh, take over and we'll just time to those questions, but I've, I've, I, I find, you know, I find working at home, if people understand, uh, again, get used to the situation and then grab a hold of it as one of your slides, you, you referenced to one of your slides of, of taking, I believe it was, if I remember correctly, um, uh, you controlling the technology, the technology not controlling you. Mm -hmm. um, when you take hold of the situation, I find, I, I found this out the first time I started working from home, which was years ago, I became absolutely much more productive not being in an office because, not because there were no other distractions, but there's a phenomenon that I found as a, as a hiring manager, um, I was always observing my employees. I, I ran 12 offices and I was always traveling. What happens when you go to an office that I have found, and you tell me if you agree or disagree with this, when you're ready to work eight to five, Monday to Friday, you as humans, I think we pace ourselves to fill the day out. Mm -hmm. When you're home and alone, you mm -hmm. have some things to do, you just get them done because I, mm -hmm. want, it, I, I mm -hmm. want it done. And then all of a sudden you realize, because I realized this when I went independent, uh, a, a very large client had 600 locations and they basically asked me to be their outsourced telecom manager. I'm in the telecommunications field and I managed all 600 locations, ads, moves and changes, closing stores, opening stores. And I literally, because I was billing them per hour as a consultant, literally I was doing a 40 hour work week in eight hours. Mm -hmm. And, and the CIO loved it because I had, and I, sometimes I would go into his office to take a meeting cause he'd want me there. And then other times I would just stay home and just do everything. But when it was just, I, when I was home and alone, I just did what I needed to do and get the job done. Like you said, con, mm -hmm. I was in that, that, that second bracket of, I just need to do the things that are important. You know, fires come up. That's true. But just get the work done. I don't have to worry about anybody around me. Just get it done. And really, I took a 40-hour work week and compressed it into eight hours, billing him at a high rate. But he loved the CIO as a person I reported to. He loved it because he didn't have to pay a 40-hour a week, you know, annual salary to someone because I was it was covered. Mm -hmm. right. Because right. I was only concerned with the work and nothing else. Mm -hmm. No office, anything, mm -hmm. just this has to be done today. Boom. It's done. That's it. I can go do what I want now. Cause that one, that task or that project is over with. Cause I got it done in two seconds. I think that makes you highly, much more highly productive. And I'm just wondering, and this is the question I want to pose to you. Do you think in the future, like so many positions now that, um, cause I'm always looking at gig jobs and things like that, that I see a lot of employee employers don't really want, that 40 hour work week, they want people under 30 hours or under 28 hours a week. Well, and it's funny you should say that. The next program that I'm working on as I start to wind down with this one, um, which I've been thinking about for a while and, and I see the necessity of it specifically in my field of HR, is what's called performance management. How do we manage performance? So it kind of ties to your question in the sense that we've always thought about an individual employee mostly working a 40 hour work week uh, although we know that that varies and we can have people for less or more, but really focusing more on what needs to get done and pointing off, not pointing off, but, you know, sh you know, giving it to this person over here to work on for 10 hours a week. Another person works on something else for 20 hours a week. And we don't necessarily have to have full-time employees everywhere. And now with this remote stuff that has been proven you know, does work again in a lot of white collar jobs. There's still a lot of things that have to be done face to face and they will continue to be done. But there's a lot of jobs that don't have to be in the world that we're living in. How will that change things? So I think, you know, it, things are not going to be as they were. I think a lot. And the longer we're in this, I think is also going to impact it. But Joe, I'm watching the time. I know we started a little bit late and we promised people a chance for Q&A and Yes. And, and question. So tell me if anything has come in or, you know, if anybody on has something to say, open up your mic and go for it. We're a small group.
I think a lot of it, um, Joshua, thank you again for coming. A lot of it has to do with um, organization, I feel like. Being at home, it's a lot easier to have things scattered about, um, you know, things on the kitchen table, in, on the desk, things like that. Do you have any tips as far as staying organized and keeping things in sort of their own areas in order to keep, you know, your productivity up? Or what, what tips do you have in that regard? That's a good question. And I understand that I was a follow up to uh, another presentation you had last week that focused on, you know, an architect that talked about how to set up space. Because as I said, a lot of people, you know, unfortunately, your homes were not built, especially in, in metro areas, you know, uh, you know, people live in apartments, not necessarily houses, or even in, in a small house or an apartment, there may just not be room, um, you know, for for it. So it's kind of like, you want to create a space in your home that's going to be, if you if you need to have things laid out where they are all the time, make suggestions. You've got to find that space. If it's you alone or you're living with other people, to say this is my workspace, and in order for me to be productive, I need this space. I need this corner of a room. Uh, I need this corner of of the bedroom or whatever it happens to be. And but then also limit yourself to that. Don't let your piles and papers and folders go all over the house, you know? So, so be sure that you ask for the space, you make the space and you keep the space. But I would say do it sooner than later because unfortunately we're gonna be living like this, many of us for a long time. Thank you, Jacob. Any other comments, questions? Okay. So I've got one in the interest of time. Um, What's your biggest takeaway from today? There's a young lady at the bottom there. I don't know your name, but um, we haven't heard from you yet. What's your biggest takeaway? Could, if you can unmute your your, uh, your mic and tell us what you got out of today. I think we all have a different setup, Joshua. Do you oh, know okay. Um, it's uh, Diane, sorry. Diane, please. What's your biggest takeaway? If you can unmute and tell us. Okay, are you all there? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I thought every part of it was was great. The time management was very helpful. Um, you know, just getting up throughout the day helps tremendously. Uh, from what I've experienced with neck and back pain, um, and sometimes just reminding myself to get up for you know, even a half hour, take a little walk around the block or sit on my front porch in the sun and, and have a little something to eat. So, What's the nature of the work you do, Diane? I'm a, a paralegal. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm required to bill uh, at least seven hours a day, sometimes more. And mm -hmm. um, like, like you said, you just get, um, you just get, you know, the day gets away from you. And before you know it, it's six o'clock and I've been sitting here since 8 a.m. <laughs> were you working remotely before you were working in an office? No, I wasn't working remotely before. In fact, my firm never uh, embraced the working from home environment up until we were forced into it. And, um, and they're now realizing that we can be much more productive, I guess, because all of our, our billing yep. is coming in and they're, you know, seeing and the work is getting done. And that, that's, that, that ties into what I was saying about my performance management workshop, the next webinar that I'm going to, to be showing uh, or that I'm developing and, and going to be uh, presenting. But yeah, I think a lot of people had a concern. You all have to be in the office. We have to see you. We have to see you're actually working. You know, that's an old, old mindset. And, you know, we need to focus instead not on, because you could sit in the office, Diane. I mean, I'm not you, but I'm saying people can be at the office. You know this and not be very productive. Just because they're there doesn't mean they're there. So, you know, it should be focused on what's the work we're giving you and how productive are you in getting it done? And once you get your, your environment organized, I mean, you might find that you're more productive in six hours than used to be eight hours in the office. And a lot of people are saying that. So thank you, thank you, Diane. Uh, so taking breaks for you was, was a good takeaway to get yes. up and move around. And also like you said, get fresh air. Um, sometimes, you know, get some sunlight. We spend so much indoors and take advantage as long as you can, even on a cold snowy day. Uh, yeah. so the sun on the snow is also nice, but Diane, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, and being outside in the, um, in the snow would be better than sitting in front of my desk all day. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So keep taking those breaks. <laughs> yes. Someone else, please share. We've got India. We've got Brian. 
um, and a gentleman from uh, Becoming Sound. I don't know your name. Stephen. Stephen, <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, I, I thought of something. Um, before the yes. pandemic, I'm self-employed. I do three different things. I'm a freelance musician. I am a massage therapist and a yoga teacher. Wow. And they, they take place at various times of day, e mm -hmm. evening, weekend, day, morning. Mm -hmm. And before the pandemic, I was starting to, to compartmentalize and allow myself only to be available for massage at certain times on certain days mm -hmm. and that, that kind of thing. And when the pandemic and I wasn't working for three months and then I started taking massage clients back, I'm, it's blank. I just said, whatever, mm -hmm. whenever, whatever people want, they call me and, they, and I mm -hmm. can make an appointment. I need to get back to that to specify. I'm, there's a fear that, that people won't come to me. They'll come, go to somebody else if I'm not available all the time. And I have to get back to that, getting rid of that fear and saying, no, if they want to come to me, they'll come to me when I'm available and make it say, no, I, I'm only available on Tuesdays from six to eight. I would recommend to you, Steve, look at your diary, look at your schedule over these last few months since you started this and look at where the concentration is because Maybe you were available a block of time in the past, but that block of time now needs to change because of what's going on for other people. And if you're comfortable with that, say for instance, hypothetically, you used to only give massages from one to five during the day. And now you're finding out people want it between three and seven. You know, are you willing to make that change, making sure it doesn't fill up your whole day? It's still the four hour block or whatever you choose to do, but it still allows you the time to do those other things that balance out your business and, and you're, still allowing, you're still being available to your clientele when they want it, just as long as it's not all over the place. So right. that would be my recommendation for you if you haven't already done that. Like pick one evening, pick one morning, yeah, yeah. Or go ahead and look back at your calendar. Go back and look at your schedule over the last few months and do some analysis of when exactly have people been asking you because maybe they asked you for appointments in the past, pre-pandemic, but now that this post, because if they were working in offices, you know, from eight to five or nine to five, they may not have been able to come to you for massages during the day. Well, now maybe they can. So right. you have to see where, where, where the requests are coming from and maybe say, okay, I used to do it in this time frame, but now I'm going to do it in this time frame, and I'm going to do my, my yoga here and I'm going to do my music there, you know? So analyze what's going on because all of this is, is possibly bringing changes for you, but thank you. Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks. Anyone else want to share? Do we have any questions or comments in the chat or Q and A box, Joe? Uh, we do not actually. Okay. Okay. Um, so, with uh, another minute or so, uh, Brian, India. It's a small, intimate group. Um, what's your biggest takeaway from today, Joshua? I think uh, one of the things for me is the same. I used to work seven days. You know, any hour of the day I'd be working. I'm in the, the travel business as an advisor. So, you know what I'm going through with that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's constantly changing. But since the pandemic, I think I've been working three times as hard. And mm -hmm. one thing I had to do was no more Sundays. Mm -hmm. Means people aren't traveling. I don't need to keep that phone with me, you know, mm -hmm. for emergencies. And usually by Saturday afternoon now I shut down. I just started doing it only a couple of weeks ago. It's working out great. And uh, it's taking away a lot of stress. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. time yeah, so. you know, there's an old expression, work smarter, not harder, right. you know, and, and, you know, maybe you want it to be more available in the past, but you don't have a need for it now. And people will adjust, you know, oh, right. well, he's not, he's not getting back to me. It'll have to wait till Monday yeah. uh, or you'll be available for a few hours. But if people <laughs> are working from home, that's one of those things they're taking a break. Oh, I need to call Brian and, and talk about this particular trip, you know, they don't have the commute time. They don't. They don't have a designated lunch time. Uh, they can. They can choose to reach out to you with a greater bit of flexibility, and therefore you don't have to accommodate as much. So that's a good point, Brian. Anyone else? Okay. Well, Joe, if not hearing anything, uh, once again, my email, my phone, my LinkedIn, and then there's that survey there underneath that says thank you. Joe will send that out. It's three or four questions, if you don't mind responding and giving us feedback. I want to thank you all again for allowing me to present to the New Jersey LGBT Chamber. 
Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank, Thank you. you. you Thank you Thank so you. much, Joshua. We really appreciate it. And everyone who, who's on here today, thank you for attending. Um, our next event will be Thursday morning at 8 o'clock. We'll have our coffee connection. And then Thursday evening, we will be having Pride at the Seafarer, a drag show in the Highlands, in Highlands, New Jersey. So please go to our website, to our calendar, and you'll see all the details there. And you can register for those events by just clicking on certain buttons. So it's really easy. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> in the chat box so if you want a quick way to get to there just go in the chat box and click away bye bye everyone bye bye now. take care, take care.